Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, Carlos Correa. The saga continues. He's now reportedly uh, increasing his talks with the Twins. We'll get into that, what that means for the Dodgers. Could the Dodgers trade Max Muncy or Chris Taylor? That's something that has been floated out there, and we get into it. And if we have time, we'll talk about another center field option that the Dodgers could go after. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans. Welcome to Locked On Dodgers. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked on, your team every day. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue. We're here every Monday through Friday, and you can catch us on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. All you got to do is search for Locked On Dodgers. And if you never want to miss a day because you know we're not going to, you can just subscribe in either or both of those places and make it easy on yourself. This is your first time listening or watching. Lucky for you, you get both of us. I'm Ben Samperio. That's my co host, Jeff Snyder. We're both lifelong Dodger fans that have spent years covering the team, continue to cover the team, and have spent time in the press box, spent time in the locker room, spent time at Dodger Stadium in pretty much every area. So we're here to talk Dodgers with you every Monday through Friday for about 30 minutes, and that's what we're here to do today. No real news uh, on the Dodgers front, no real Big news uh, around MLB. Brett Phillips signed with the Angels. Brandon Belt signed with the Blue Jays. Uh, none of those really affect the Dodgers too much. Although Brandon Belt, they won't, you know, Kershaw won't get to strike him out anymore or not as often as he did in the past. Uh, but the one news that did come out, Carlos Correa reports are that he's talking with the Twins again, that talks are accelerating a little bit, that the chances of him going there are increasing, although it's still was said that you know the Mets are still trying to get a deal done. It seems like Cray is opening the door again. We've talked about the possibility of this now <laughs> twice before, and this will be the third time of this opening the door for the Dodgers. While I don't know that would still be the case, this does affect the Dodgers in a different way, and more than maybe in a couple of different ways uh, that we're going to get into, right, Jeff? Yeah, and, and you know the Dodgers could get back in it. It's, uh, but that's definitely a background thing. Especially, you know, the the rest of our episode is going to be talking about the Dodgers' efforts to get under the the luxury tax. And so, if that's still their goal, yeah, they're not going to get back in, in on Correa. Although Correa does strike me as the kind of guy who they might change their plans for if they uh, obviously if they were really shying away from him because of fear of fan backlash, then they wouldn't. But you know it if they were just shying away because he wanted a ton of years and they weren't interested in doing that, if he gets down to where he's looking for a five-year contract, I could see the Dodgers getting in on it and saying, well, sorry, luxury tax, maybe next year uh, and probably not then either. But yeah, the, the bigger way that this affects the, the Dodgers is originally Correa had signed with the Giants, who the Dodgers are going to play 14 times this year. And then he moved to, uh, to sign with the Mets, who they're going to play, I assume, seven times this year. Uh, Actually, I don't know if that changed the the. I know they play every team, uh, but it probably takes away. Actually, I don't know. I haven't looked at the schedule, but probably about seven times they'll play the Mets. Uh, and more importantly, there's a pretty good chance the Dodgers will meet up with the Mets in the postseason. Uh, at least we hope so. And uh, so, create to the Mets would have been a big deal. Create to the Twins means the Dodgers have one series with the Twins this year, May fifteenth through seventeenth, and uh, beyond that. It would be okay. We'll see you in the World Series. The Twins went 78 and 84 last year with Carlos Correa. The Twins aren't going to the World Series. And so, from a Dodger standpoint, uh, Carlos Correa is very good. He's a very good hitter, a very good baseball player. And the less the Dodgers have to play him, the better, as far as I'm concerned. And so, uh, yeah, go to the Twins or go sign in the KBO or something. Yeah. So, they play the Mets six times this year. So, uh, maybe they did shave off one game off the normal seven that they play with the other teams in the National League. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's – the Dodgers could get back in if Correa really drops it down, and I think he'd have to get, like, under probably five or six years, and even that's pushing it uh, for the Dodgers to get back in it at the price and the – especially with all this stuff coming out with Correa and his leg and everything else. 
but it, it does help because we've talked about the Dodgers, seen a lot of teams get better so far in the National League West and in the National League. The Dodgers were leaps and bounds ahead of some of those teams in terms of wins last year. So even with the other teams getting around, the Dodgers losing some guys, they're, they're still in a good spot. But, you know, a potential playoff opponent that doesn't have Carlos Correa is better than a potential playoff opponent that does, especially being the Mets with, you know, Scherzer and, and Verlander, guys at the top of their rotation. You know, they're, they're the Mets right now maybe are built for the postseason, maybe not as much as they are built for the regular season in terms of depth. But they're still going to probably be in the playoffs. They were a 100-win team last year with basically similar team. Um, and the rest of that division is going to be good. You know, the Phillies added another left-hander that throws hard at the back of their bullpen, and they've improved. You know, the Braves have picked up, you know, catcher Sean Murphy. Everyone's been kind of improved first. So for the Dodgers, for teams to start getting rid of guys or not getting guys that they were supposed to get, that's going to help out. And, yeah, with this Correa thing, it's good for – engagement if you are if your day job is doing a social media page for baseball because the continued back and forth and new developments and everything else has been fun uh but even as a baseball fan in general i just kind of want it to all come to fruition uh and and just you know let me have a, a month off before pitchers and catchers report yeah i can see that although you know it, it's also kind of fun for me that you know it's been it's been three weeks since he agreed to a deal with the mets which was uh, I think what at least a week after he agreed to his deal with the Giants, and so I, it, it's been a month now. And uh, if Correa really becomes available again, it, it's just you know it would definitely set the record for uh, most times being a free agent in one off season, I guess. And uh, he's already signed or agreed to twenty five years worth of contracts this off season, which is already a record. Imagine if he adds another eight year deal with the Twins or something, get up to thirty three years just in one off season. Uh, that would be pretty impressive. That would, uh, what that would take Korea through his age sixty one season now. So uh, third physical, yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know maybe he'll pass one. I I remember I a few years ago, this is actually more than a few because uh, it was Jeremy Guthrie and he's been retired for a while. There was some sort of hubbub about uh, the Orioles and somebody failing a physical. I don't remember who it was, but I remember Jeremy Guthrie tweeting out that uh, his proudest career achievement was passing three different Orioles physicals. And uh, that, yeah, I can't remember who it was, but that, that's kind of, I've, I've been thinking about that tweet lately just because uh, Carlos Correa can't seem to pass one physical. Yeah, it was Grant Balfour was one of the guys. And then I don't remember who the other one was. I remember Grant Balfour was one of them, though, that couldn't pass that Oreos physical. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it, it doesn't mean too much right now. Now, if talks with the Mets completely break off, you know, the twins are there kind of like the backup role, but, you know, knowing Scott Boris, he's going to contact more teams and see who else, if anyone is willing to jump in there. And it's a matter of, you know, last year, Correa took that short term high AV deal with all the opt outs just because, you know, he didn't look like he was going to get the money he wanted. And this offseason, you know, he potentially thought he could get that. But for him now, it's okay if you, you know, you can take a short term high AAV deal, maybe get some opt outs in there. But, you know, does playing one more year or one more year removed from that surgery, does, I don't know if that really helps out considering the fact that he's still going to have, you know, that plate in his leg and that's still going to be a concern. So it's really interesting times for him. And at this point, he might have to take anything over six years that he can get. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if this does fall apart, if they do go back to the open market if they actually share those those medical reports, you know, the MRI or whatever it is, with all interested teams and say, okay, review this and then give us your best offer. And you know, we're we're not doing another physical. Here's the here's what you've seen. And, and you know, because I can't imagine they want to go through this a third time of agreeing to a deal and then having it fall apart. And so they're gonna have to change their approach if this one does fall apart. Yeah, so we'll continue to follow the, the saga of Carlos Correa. We're going to get into some potential trade talk. Nothing that's been solidified as any rumors, uh, but something the Dodgers could do if they're really intent on getting under that luxury tax threshold. But first, let's talk about Bet Online because today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get all the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there. 
college bowl season just wrapped up, so that's over with. But you got pro football, you got basketball, you got other sports, you got you know overseas soccer, you got all that stuff. So check it all out at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, they got those there as well. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to betonline.net on your laptop or mobile device today to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, Jeff. So we've seen this idea floated on social media a little bit. I want to say I read it. Well, I did read an article talking about it today, but I don't remember who, whether it was one of the actual beat writers or one of the blog sites that cover the Dodgers. But uh, either way, the premise is that the Dodgers are looking to get under the $233 million payroll threshold or the payroll uh, for the luxury tax threshold with Trevor Bauer seemingly going to be released and they eat that 22 mil. They're right under that 233 mil. So what would you do if you're trying to get lower than that? You have to shed some payroll. Now the Dodgers don't really have too much payroll to shed in terms of people that they're willing to part ways with or guys, you know, that they could you know, guys that like the reverse of the deal they've done in the past with guys that get paid a lot that maybe they could attach uh, a, a prospect to to get rid of them they don't really have that but they do have two guys that are supposed to play pom- prominent roles on the Dodgers this year but they are the the next highest value guys or, or AAV guys that that would make sense in terms of trading one of them is Max Muncie one of them is Chris Taylor Max Muncie is supposed to be an everyday player whether at second or third base Chris Taylor is supposed to be a somewhat everyday player at the moment moving around like he's done in the past uh, but yeah, Jeff, I mean, well, we'll, we can go with both. We can start with one, but these are two guys that I don't, I mean, I don't put, I don't see the Dodgers doing this. I don't know how intent they are in getting under this threshold, but those would be the two ones that make the most sense. Yeah, they, they do make sense in a way and that they both make, you know, if you look at, at the Dodgers, uh, payroll, obviously they're not going to trade Freddie Freeman or Mookie Betts or Clayton Kershaw. Those are the three guys who make more than Taylor and Muncie. And, uh, the Dodgers don't necessarily need to trade a ton of money away because, you know, as of right now, they're right basically at the luxury tax number. There's going to be, you know, they they may still need to add a player or two. Um, Noah Syndergaard has some bonuses in his in his contract. I assume there's a couple other, uh, you know, uh, performance uh, contract incentive clauses that they might need to worry about. But, uh, you know, what we're probably looking at is a midseason trade. Because uh, that, that's the thing about the luxury tax. It's not calculated until the end of the year. And so the Dodgers could the, – the tricky part for both of these guys, and Taylor more than Muncie, is they're both coming off down years. And Taylor is coming off a terrible year. Muncie was terrible, but then he got good the, the second half of the season. But it still overall was a, a down year. And so the the value there isn't as much. And – in a way, that's not as much of an issue because the Dodgers wouldn't necessarily be looking to maximize their return. They'd be looking to shed the payroll. But obviously, uh, you'd like to maximize your return too. And you'd rather trade a player who has high value. You know, if Muncie is classic Max Muncie making 13 and a half million bucks, he's a huge bargain and he could be a benefit to a team. The, the other tricky part with both of them is trading a guy. You know, the teams that are going to be looking to acquire these guys are teams that are planning on making the playoffs. And so uh, you're trading a guy who could end up contributing to a team you might meet. Imagine trading Max Muncie and then facing him in the postseason, you know, uh, or Chris Taylor. Uh, And so it's, I don't know, it's like, it's one of those things where it makes sense mathematically. Okay, you trade Muncie at midseason, you just saved... 7 million bucks. You know, you trade Taylor, you just saved seven and a half million bucks. Uh, if you trade him at midseason, mathematically it makes sense. But as far as the actual individuals, the only way I, I, I guess a lot of it might come down to Michael Bush. You know, how good is Michael Bush? If he comes in and forces his way into playing time, well, then that does make Max Muncy superfluous a little bit. And, uh, you know, if, if, if these young guys come up and perform, that makes some of the higher paid guys expendable. Uh, but other than that, it's hard to it's hard for me to see it happening. Yeah, definitely don't see it happening before the season starts. That would be, you know, a legitimate, you know, 
it wouldn't be fair to the fans and and they're not their job isn't to be fair to the fans but you know for them to if they would have done something like this or they did something like this it's basically saying you know we're not entirely trying to put the best product on the field or we're going to hope that some of these younger guys work out and we're trying to also get under the luxury tax at the same time now you know with the trevor bauer you know that's that 22 million that they didn't they weren't sure they were going to have on the roster uh that you know maybe prevented them from going after some other people during free agency this past this winter and with that there you know there's there's people of the mindset, well, you know, they should have just kept them for that sake. There's people of the mindset, well, you know, they, they made their bed, now they have to lay in it type of thing. But it's also something where, you know, it's hard to preach. You're trying to put the best roster out there and also trying to shed a bunch of payroll. You know, the Dodgers, as Dodger fans, we've already had to say bye to Cody Bellinger, which, you know, depending on how you felt, kind of how I talked about in your study episode, he did a lot of good for the Dodgers. Uh, but not maybe so much the last couple of years. Justin Turner did a lot, a lot of good for the Dodgers. Maybe not so much the last two Octobers, which, you know, you can see them that that there. But that opening was there because they were free agents. You know, they 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 didn't have to actively get rid of them, whereas this potential idea would be actively getting rid of guys that are, one, fan favorites. Two, they've been, you know, part of the success of the team for the last few years. Three, coming off down years, like you said, if there is – in any type of value they can extract it's not really there and for right now it's supposed to be you know parts of this team now yeah michael bush miguel vargas some of these young guys can come out and either make the team in bush's case making the team out of out of spring and being really good but you know you we've seen rookies that can come out really hot and then either cool down or get you know they start to figure them out whatever the case at least with Max Muncy and Chris Taylor, yeah, they had down years, but they have sustained success long enough so far that you can imagine that they're going to be good enough, um, you know, at least above average. Now, the other part with Chris Taylor is that he still has two more years after this year at 15 mil. So that's a lot tougher to trade without maybe attaching something with him. And then you're just looking at straight salary dump, which is something a team like the Dodgers shouldn't be doing. Yeah, except one other guy who has been mentioned some – uh, that we haven't talked about yet is Blake Trinan, who isn't going to contribute to this year's team. It would be a straight salary dump. And uh, it, I mean, Blake Trinan would almost feel like an NBA kind of trade where you're trading a contract more than a player. Uh, and, you know, I could see a trade where the Dodgers, they could do this one before the season starts because it doesn't affect this year's team. The, the sooner they do it, the more they save. He's making 8 million bucks this year. Uh, and so if they trade Blake Trinan and two prospects, to somebody for a lesser prospect. And so basically saying, Hey, we'll give you two prospects. If you pay this 8 million bucks for us is basically what that would be. Uh, and that that's a trade I could actually see happening. And that would be, you know, trading Blake Trinan before the season saves you more money than trading Taylor or Muncie at mid season does at least for this year. And so that one, you know, Trinan, he has some, he has an option for next year. I don't know if it's a just a straight team option or or what it is, but he's most he's signed for this year and he's very unlikely to pitch at all this year. If at all, it would be late in the season. And so that's one that I would think that they are exploring. The Dodgers do have a lot of depth in the minor leagues, and uh they probably have it's not like they'd have to give up Bobby Miller to get rid of Blake Trainer's contract. It's not that high of a contract. You know, and ideally the Dodgers would like to eat as little of the money on Trinan's contract as possible. And, you know, for me, I'd rather have them give up their, you know, 23rd and 25th prospects than pay pay the money if they could if that can help them get below the luxury tax and and so that next year we can have a normal offseason where the Dodgers are in on everybody and spending money like crazy. Yeah, and that part gets them under it enough to where they could potentially bring something back at the deadline, you know, mine, obviously not a high price guy. If their goal would still be to be under the threshold, but you know, somebody that's either on a rookie contract still, or, or still, you know, pre-arb or whatever the case, if there is somebody out there like that. So there's a lot there, you know, like I said, I don't believe anything's going to happen before the season. And especially with Muncie or Taylor training could be a guy that they do, you know, they, they do have guys like you mentioned, a lot of depth that teams could find. And there's teams out there that, you know, maybe could be, trying to say hey this is something the Dodgers knew maybe we should try it. you know maybe the Reds want to have the reverse 
side of that deal. I don't think they'll get Josiah Gray and, and Jeter Downs out of it, but, you know, whatever, they'll get somebody potentially. And if it's from the Dodgers system, it's probably better than some of the guys that have in their system. So you never know. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I don't, you know, I know you still expect something to happen with the Dodgers making a trade. So if that's the case, then, you know, all this kind of gets thrown out the window if they do exceed that or if, you know, maybe Taylor is or Muncie goes with bigger prospects for a bigger name that makes less money. And that's still, I guess, possible. But there's still a lot that can happen in the next month, two months until the season starts. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, one of those names that, that could be one of those deals that the Dodgers make is Jared Kelnick, who has been mentioned a few times in a few articles. Is he a realistic or worthy option for the Dodgers to look at? We'll get into that right now. But first, let's talk about Bilt Bar. Today's episode is brought to you by Bilt Bar. And if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try Bilt Bar. We've been telling you about Bilt Bars for a while now. But, hey. They are now in stores. You don't have to order them online. You can go to your nearest Walmart or Sam's Club today. Go to the pharmacy section. Grab yourself a box of Built Bars. What are you going to get with Built Bars? Well, you're going to get a great tasting protein bar, first of all, covered in 100% real chocolate. You're going to get great flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, cookies and cream, coconut puffs, brownie batter. There's a bunch of different flavors they got there. But you're going to get all that great part of it. We're also getting the great part of being healthy, low calories, low sugar, low carbs, high protein, high fiber, whatever kind of lifestyle you're trying to live, Built Bar can fit into it. And like I mentioned, now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. Just walk in there and grab a four bar box or a 13 bar box. So thank you. can thank us now. You can thank us later, but go get you some Built Bars and you'll for sure be thanking us at some point. So go get Built Bars. Thank you for making Lockdown Dodgers your first listen of the day. Check out Locked On MLB Prospects with host Lindsey Crosby. He's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. I feel bad for all you guys who haven't been able to buy Built Bar at your local stores until now. You know, it helps. I live like three and a half miles from the Built Factory. I drive past it all the time, but uh, I've had Built Bars at my local grocery stores for, for two years now. So I, I'm happy for all you guys who can go down to Walmart now. Yeah, there you go. So head out there and get it. All right, Jeff. So Jared Kelnick has been mentioned in a few articles. I believe one by Ken Rosenthal. I think Fabian Ardaya used him uh, probably from that same reporting um, as a guy the Dodgers could think about in center field. The Mariners signed A.J. Pollock this this weekend. Uh, I don't know what their plans are for him, but the Mariners do have a little bit of depth in the outfield now. They have Tasker Hernandez, they have A.J. Pollock, they have Julio Rodriguez obviously in center field. And then they got guys like Taylor Trammell, Cooper Hummel, Sam Haggerty in the outfield. Jared Kalnick didn't even spend the entire season last year in the majors, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, he could be one of those guys that is available for trade. But is he a guy that the Dodgers should be considering? Is he really that much of an upgrade offensively? Is there something the Dodgers can work with him? I don't know, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, my bigger concern about Kelnick, I, I think Kelnick is going to hit. He hasn't yet in the big leagues, but he was a very, very good hitter in the minor leagues, and I think he's probably going to figure it out offensively. Uh, my bigger concern is I don't think he's a center fielder. I think he's a a guy who has played some center field, but uh, you know he he was better in 2022 than he had been the year before. But I, I'm still not sold on him as a center fielder. You know, we talked about when we were talking about uh, Brian Reynolds, that one of the concerns about him is if his bad defense last year was indicative of what's to come and he's not going to stick in center field, well, then his value goes way down because, you know, he's a very good hitter for a center fielder. He's not, he's still solid for a corner outfielder, but not nearly as good. And Kelnick is kind of the same thing. Even if he reaches his offensive potential, that there's less value as a corner outfielder and less filling a need that the Dodgers have if he can't play center field regularly. And, and that's the, for, for me, that's the biggest concern because I do think, and I could be wrong. There have been plenty of guys who were good hitters in the minor leagues all the way up through AAA and never did figure it out in the big leagues. You know, uh, Brandon Wood comes to mind for the angels. That dude was top prospect for years and, just never did hit in the big leagues. And, and there's been plenty of those guys. And Kelnick could be one of those. Uh, the, the advantage of Kelnick would be, well, the advantage and part of the reason why the trade probably wouldn't happen in the first place 
the Mariners would have to sell low on Kilnick. They, you know, they're not going to get much for him right now. And for a guy who used to be one of the top prospects in baseball, he was ranked as high as number four overall just a couple of years ago. It would it would be a a tough pill for them to swallow to uh, trade him. It, it's funny now that that Kelnick trade when Kelnick uh, came over from the Mets to the Mariners, that looked like such a steal for them for the Mariners. They the the Mets got Robinson Cano and Edwin Diaz, and Diaz struggled, and Cano was Cano, uh, and and the Mets or the Mariners got Kelnick and who was it Justin Dunn? I think uh, these really good prospects, and now. Neither of those guys has really panned out much, and Edwin Diaz turned into a really good player. And uh, you know, there's still Robinson Cano, but uh, that that trade seems less lopsided than it used to. But yeah, it, it's hard to see the Mariners and Dodgers lining up on a trade simply in terms of how they value the player. Yeah, and when it comes to it, you know, the Mariners are a team made the postseason for the first time in over 20 years last year. They're a team that's looking for players to impact their major league roster right now. And the Dodgers don't necessarily have those type of guys. Like, you know, we, we just talked about Taylor and, and Muncie, but, I, you know, I don't think one of those guys is going to go in a trade for Jared Koenig. You, you know, maybe it's possible, but I doubt it. And the Dodgers don't really have much else in terms that they can be willing to part with that wouldn't significantly hurt their current major league team as well. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense in that realm if there's a guy – you know, maybe a guy, you know, it would, you'd have to be, yeah, it's weird because, you know, they're going to, the Mariners are going to be selling low. The Dodgers are, are trying to get him for, you know, somebody obviously not as good or not as touted, but the Mariners would probably, you know, just based on the years of how many years he, he until he's a free agent for Kelnick, you know, the Mariners would be in the right mind to ask for, you know, a top upper echelon prospect, maybe not a top five type of guy, but top, six to 10, six to 15, maybe. And I don't know if that's something that ours want to part with either. So yeah, the name's been thrown around, you know, maybe we'll talk Dylan Carson's name's been thrown around too. Maybe we can talk about that on tomorrow's episode, but it just doesn't seem to make sense for the Dodgers in turn, you know, to get a project. If they wanted a project, they could have kept Bellinger for one more year, albeit at a much higher salary than Kelnick is. But you know, if they wanted a project, that's what they're going to do. And if they wanted a project, they have James Outman who can be just as much of a project, you know, Kelnick has been in the majors. He has had some success in terms of power numbers, but not so much success in terms of hitting his OPS plus for his career is 66. He has hit, you know, 21 home runs in his career in the major leagues, but that's at a 168 batting average, 589 OPS, 66 OPS plus. So while there's probably stuff there to unlock, I don't think the Dodgers are in the market for a project and not one that's going to cost them a prospect that could just as be as likely a project as he is. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Maybe tomorrow we could also talk about Trent Grisham as a possibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how, how Preller and Friedman get along. I don't know if there's any, but you know, that is possible. They do have some, a uh, little bit of depth now in terms of guys that are, oh, could be available, but so yeah, no Jared Kelnick. Uh, we'll talk about some other guys tomorrow. We'll continue to cover and, and follow this Carlos Correa stuff. There's not much left else on the free agent market. We haven't really heard any buzz on the trade market. So if, as long as that continues, we're probably going to keep talking about this roster as it's currently constructed and get into a few different things. So with all that being said, Jeff, you got anything else before we head out? I think that's it for today. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day. Check out Locked On, uh, Locked on MLB Prospects with host Lindsey Crosby. He's a prospect encyclopedia, and he's looking at the future. So it's free and available wherever you get podcasts. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Amperio. DMs are open on all those accounts if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. You can also send those via email, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or via voicemail text at 323-863-5625. We're every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us. When you get in your car, if you're at home, tell your smart advice play podcast, Locked on Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you tomorrow.